and where we hope to go in the months ahead. So please let me introduce and welcome uh, Rula Gandhi, First Lady of Afghanistan. taking a Friday afternoon to come and listen to me. I hope it will be worth it. Um, I just want to first start by saying there are two reasons why I want to speak up. Uh, one is that uh, um, it so happens that I've come on the week of Veterans Day and Veterans Week. And I think it gives me a good opportunity to thank all the people, all the Americans that have sacrificed sometimes their lives or their health uh, to help Afghanistan. And that I want to assure you that their sacrifice has not been in vain. And the reason I'm saying that it has not been in vain because unlike what you might read in the press or you might be hearing, uh, the country is not crumbling. There's no article I read about Afghanistan where they don't use the adjective crumbling. The country is not crumbling. The government is getting stronger by the day. And as Ambassador Wayne has just said, there are a lot of achievements. And you have helped create those achievements. You have helped create the atmosphere for a new country a new, a strong country, because this government is going to be a strong government. That said, let me also state that uh, I'm here talking as myself. I happen to be the wife of the president, but I'm not in the government. So what you hear is not the official line. But what you will hear is what I hear from the people that come and see me. You know, I have a little office. And uh, because I don't move a lot, I have an open door policy. And uh, people have taken the habit of coming and seeing me. I usually see groups of people, not too many individuals, because I don't deal with individual problems like uh, I need to have an operation, or I need a job, or uh, you know, these kind of things. I cannot. We are almost 36 million of people. I cannot attend to every of them. But I can attend to groups. And uh, I love listening to people. I love trying to find out what the problems are and uh, talk with them about what kind of solutions they could find and to advocate for them. So basically, um, what I would be saying is a little bit what I hear from everyone. And I do hear a lot, as I was saying a few minutes ago with another group, uh, I usually get the gossips before my husband. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so this being said, uh, it gives you co the context in which I'll be, I'll be talking and discussing things with the ambassador. Thank you. Well, in 
fact, over the past two years, it has been clear that Afghans of all, on all parts of the political spectrum long for peace. Yes. And you have, as part of your dialogue, and part of your effort in encouraging women to discuss these issues, um, to form their own thinking and then to share those thoughts. Could you talk a little bit about that process and what you've heard from women and how you, you've seen their willingness to participate in all? Um, but, um, yeah, I'm going to put this on my head because my microphone will work better. <laughs> yes. If you want, I speak up. Is that okay? Okay, so basically, uh, in the past two years, and it's probably a topic of the hour, which is uh, the possibility of bringing peace to our country. Already from the start, people, when they talk, spoke to me, always complained that uh, we're tired of war, we want peace. And uh, slowly, slowly, it became uh, a much larger uh, uh, sound and much larger uh, uh, declaration that people want to, to have a normal life. And uh, women in particular, because women take care of the house, take care of the children, they would say, uh, I worry every morning when my children go to school, are they going to come back or will there be a mom? Uh, so uh, once in February 2018, uh, President Ghani announced that she was ready to start negotiation with the Taliban. Uh, everybody was so happy. Everybody said, okay, we're going to find peace. But we all know peace takes time. And uh, we have uh, been uh, talking about it. I'm sure the government has had uh, pre-negotiations uh, trying to prepare the ground. And, uh, but what has, ha what has happened is that um, people started uh, embracing it and starting to talk about it as if it's something that is going to happen for sure. And you know, we, uh, we had a very successful uh, ceasefire for three days. Right after that declaration, there was, it was a meet, one of the religious festivals. And uh, my husband said we had a ceasefire for, uh, he was, <laughs> Yes, we made a declaration that we had a ceasefire for a week. And the Taliban said, okay, we'll do it for three days, because the region generally is three to four days. And it was incredible. Young Taliban came to the urban centers. Uh, they left their arms uh, at the entrance and were able to go freely. Uh, to see people, people embraced them, welcomed them, they were surprised. And because it was a religious festival, the mosques were open, there were people praying, they went into the mosque, they found out that, well, this is the same kind of prayer as we're doing. It's the same thing. So it was really a very uh, important um, experience for them. And actually, a few of the younger ones decided, okay, let me find a different job than being a target. And maybe this is why ever since that very successful ceasefire, whenever the government asks, let's do a ceasefire, or whenever even at the Doha post, they were asked, can you do a ceasefire? And they say, no, no ceasefire. It shows their insecurity. They're worried that if ever this fight happens, a lot of their combatants will leave. Anyway, so uh, to make the, a long story very short, uh, so the government was engaged into pre-negotiations, and then uh, 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 I think uh, in December of 2018, uh, we woke up to. Uh, Mr. Trump 
thinking that uh, all truths need to be removed from our system. It's something that's logical that has been there for 18 years, and uh, it is time that they should be moved. And the answer of the government was to send a letter saying, okay, we do have this uh, treaty between us, and uh, uh, which is called the BSA, Bilateral Security Agreement. Let's discuss it within the treaty and let's do it gradually so that it, we don't have, uh, um, we, we can adapt to the transition. Uh, unfortunately, and I'm not privy, I'm not the government. I don't know exactly what happened, but I know that sometime in March, we found out that America is talking to the Taliban in Doha. And uh, we were not told beforehand, and the, uh, the employee who shuttled between Doha and then Qatar would supposedly tell us what we, he was doing. Never, I mean, he would talk, but he would never give a written report. It was never clear what he was discussing. So we've had this since March, and you know, uh, it eventually uh, did not come to fruition when uh, uh, President Trump decided that that was a secret to have it anymore. I think it was in September that he said that. Anyway, but the reason I'm mentioning that is that the Doha talks brought a lot of anxiety to the Afghans because they were not told what was happening. And the ones that were the most uh, perturbed about it were the women because it's very clear that uh, the Taliban had a very particular way of looking at women and uh, of saying what is that place in society. That's very different from what the women now enjoy in Afghanistan. And uh, so the women really were very vocal, and you must have seen that in the media, in uh, either making declaration or being in the round tables or being uh, 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 writing op-eds or reaching out to, they may have reached out to some of you because they reached out to them. Uh, sisters all over the world. And uh, from that started the discussion. What is it that we can negotiate? What is it we, what kind of results do we want at the end? What are the things we cannot live without? It was very important. Slowly men also took part in it in the discussion, but they were more cautious at first. The women were the one who felt it very strongly. And uh, um, there have been a flurry of discussions, of uh, uh, events, uh, conferences uh, from uh, uh, civil society, from embassies, from international aid agencies. It doesn't, a week hasn't go by that there is somewhere some big discussion about uh, what is peace, how should we bring it about, and what are our red lines. And the discussion was a long process, several months, but very quickly people realized that there was one document, an official document, that really protected the rights they enjoyed at this time, and their access to services, and the achievements they have made. And that document is the Afghan constitution. So this is why you will hear people saying, my red line is Afghan constitution. I'm telescoping the whole argument in just one sentence. And at first you might think, okay, uh, it's an empty, it's an empty slogan. It's not. The constitution says very clearly, all Afghans are equal. No Afghan is better or worse than another. That men and women are equal. And that they are all equally, um, uh, equally have the right to access health services, education services, legal services. Another point that for me was extremely interesting is that in the constitution, 
there is also the kind of economy we have and it states that we have a free market economy. So all the business people now suddenly say, now we want this constitution, this, is, this protects our right to be able to uh, transact, uh, 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 do our, uh, our work, uh, uh, work with other countries, bring the, uh, in things without having the government interfering or planifying what we can do and what we cannot do. So, in a way, I'm happy that there were the Doha talks because it brought all this discussion and it brought a clarity to the people of Afghanistan and a um, unified voice. Uh, you know, we have freedom of speech in Afghanistan. It's not a joke. We really have freedom of speech. Uh, my husband is often uh, in South Sudan in public uh, debates. Uh, I sometimes suffer some criticism. Uh, but uh, uh, I can't take it because we're comfortable with what we're doing because uh, you know, everybody has their own opinion. Uh, the result of the freedom of speech is that uh, in the month of August, we were celebrating our 100th anniversary of um, independence from the British. Uh, there were a lot of programs on TV, historical programs, uh, debates, uh, and everybody was watching TV, and I was watching too. And I had the chance to see uh, two different debates in which one member of the panel was in Poland. And I had the chance to hear in their own words what they were saying. And unfortunately, they have not changed their mind about women. They still say that we are Nafasilak or Nafasilin. That's where the exact word, which means incomplete brains and very poor knowledge of religion. So we're very clear about this. They tell us all so the Taliban have changed, they now are respectful for the women in some of the, um, uh, some of the uh, 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 occasional, uh, I don't know, call it meetings, they will open the door to the women, they will let them go, this is, this is a big change. Well, but they still think that the women cannot think and know nothing about religion. So uh, as far as I'm concerned, there is, a lot to be done before we can reach an agreement. In another, in the other panel, what had happened is that uh, one person had asked them, "Okay, you want to come and govern Afghanistan? So, what is your plan for the economy development of the country?" And the man said, "Oh, it's very simple. We'll apply whatever we have learned in madrasas. They won't teach." You. So, uh, are they ready to govern? In the five years they were in Afghanistan, because they were only there for five years from 96 to 2001. Did they manage to govern the country? I'm not quite sure. I arrived early 2002, and I had to look high and low to find a little plastic pocket that I needed to use in my house. So, um, yes, peace is definitely on the docket. We want peace. How are we going to achieve it? Still a big question. So, what kind of steps do you think? This is why I say it's going to take time. So in that connection, what's your perception of the security situation? There have been a lot of times, mm -hmm. there have been too many civilian casualties in general, too many innocent people being killed, unfortunately. Um, the Taliban, of course, seem the time to boast about their military crowds. Well, what's your perspective from, from where you sit? Again, here I have a little bit of a beef with India. Because whenever you read an article on uh, Afghanistan, 
they all say, oh, the Taliban control half of the country, they control two-thirds of the country, uh, 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 you know, the government is not in control. So before time, because security is not my, my work, of course, I live in a country where I have to be aware of what, uh, what is the situation, but I ask from the professional, uh, where are the uh, Taliban in control? What part of Afghanistan the Taliban are in control of? And the answer was, of the 364 districts, we have 34 provinces that are divided into 364 districts. The Taliban control, fully control, 12 districts. It doesn't mean they are in control of the country or the third of the country. The other thing is Taliban are Afghans. So they are free to go and and how do you bring to uh, uh, go in every corner of the country? And their modus operandi, the way they operate, uh, is uh, hit and run. You know, or suicide bombing. So, uh, yes, they can create havoc in all of Afghanistan. They are not in control. So, my perception of the security is that Eventually, with the government becoming more and more organized, with especially the uh, ministries of uh, the security, uh, the security ministry, which is Ministry of Interior, Ministry of Defense, and the NDS, the intelligence, uh, are going to slowly be able to prepare all this unrestness and uh, rest, restlessness, and it, uh, they, they are going to be able to uh, reduce <coughs> the ability of the Taliban to hit and run and to create havoc in uh, I don't know if you, if it was really very much talked about in the news, uh, in Badakhshan, they have already claimed that it was, it was a given for the Taliban. And recently, as I was leaving for coming here, it was the uh, return of Ninkafa for Jalalabad, where not only the Taliban, but also Daesh, had been picked out from the places that they had bases in the So um, I know you can tell me probably they will come back. It's possible that they will be back. But still, they're not no longer secure, these areas are no longer secure for them. So I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful, but again, it will take a long time. Thank you very much. Can we invite some questions? Thank you. Thank you.